Welcome again to our program titled Re Revelation of the Coming King. I'm Ranko Stefanovic, professor at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary, Andrews University, and I'm so excited that we can spend this time to develop the book of Revelation and try to understand the relevance, message of that book for us today. Last time I spoke about my accent, but this is not the only thing that people are confused about with regard to me. They ask about my name. So let me just take a few moments and say a little bit about my name. My name is Aranko Stefanovic. Aranko, in my Croatian language, means an early one. You know, sometimes parents, they make mistake by naming children, by giving them certain names, early one. Okay, but my last name, Stefanovic, actually comes from Greek. In Greek language, there are two words for a crown. One is the Greek word diadema. You can guess already that from that we have the English diadem, and it's a royal crown. When we go to the book of Revelation, we see in Revelation 19 that Jesus has many diadema crowns on his head. So that crown is reserved exclusively for God and Jesus Christ. But we will come to that. You will notice in the book of Revelation that there is another entity in the book that claims such a crown. Probably you already guess. If you go to Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 13, you will see that the dragon and the sea beast claims that crown. So we are dealing here with the power opposing to God and claiming the prerogatives of God. But human beings are not promised such a crown. The second word for, for crown in Greek, it's a Stephanos crown. That's not a royal crown. It's a garland give, uh, given to the winners at ancient Olympic games. It's the crown of victory. This is the crown that is promised to us. For instance, when we read in 2 Timothy chapter 4, chapter 4, Paul says, I finished the race, my life is over, and I know that to me, Stephanus' crown is promised. He said, not only to me, but to all those who are waiting for his coming. Revelation chapter 3, verse 11, be faithful until the point of death, and I will give you the Stephanus of life. It is out of this Greek word, Stephanos, that actually my name comes from. Okay? Stephan, the Western Stephen, are both der derived from this word. And Stefanovich actually means a little Stephen in my language. You know, the person lived somewhere, he was a foreigner there, and people ask, who is this person? He is son of Stephen, little Stephen. In my language, it's Stefanovich. That's how, actually how people got their second names. So this is a little bit about my name, but in the same time, we want to see different aspects of the book of Revelation, Revelation there. So if you, among our viewers, if you have the name Stephen, just to know that is rooted strictly in that biblical promise that one day when our Savior Jesus Christ come, we will get that Stephanos of life. But today, we would like to go to another aspect of the book of Revelation. Keep in mind, we are still in verse 1. <laughs> and believe me, we can spend hours and hours just on the first three verses of the book of Revelation, which actually are a part of the prologue of the prologue of the book. But about that, we'll talk later. So please, I'd like to ask you, if you can open your Bibles again, but please, I want to fulfill my promise. I will do it always at the beginning of our study and at the end. If you are able to hold in your hands my commentary that we recommended last time, you still have a chance somehow to 
provide a copy for yourself. Our presentation today, it's based on the pages if you want to follow and later to study for yourself from page 17, one seven in my commentary. So 17, 18, 19, 19 20, 21, and so on. And then also part of what we will cover today is found on pages 58, 59, 60, and 61. But our focus will be primarily from pages 17. So I would like to encourage you once um, we are done with this presentation, I would like you really to get more information there from my commentary, but to take the Bible. This is our primary textbook, as we mentioned last time. And please go and continue and study this book for yourself, whether by yourself or in a group of some devoted Christians who would like also to, to study together to get the meaning, the meaning of that book. So what are we talking about today? Please, would you turn back to that opening text of the book of Revelation, uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, we saw it last time, that this is the title of the book, which God gave him, and then we saw the purpose of the book, to show to his servants the things which must soon take place. But now we are going to the last part of this verse, it said, and he, who is that he? Jesus Christ himself. He sent, and my new American standard version says, and he communicated it by his angel to his servant, John. The casual reader of the book of Revelation, especially when you read this in English, and because of different Bible translations, you don't see anything too much significant here, except that Jesus revealed to John, the revelator, things that are mentioned at the very beginning of this text, things that will take place in the future. And I just want to tell you, I want simply to show to you how sometimes we need really to go to the biblical language. I know we are, not everybody can read Greek and Hebrew, and that's okay. That's why we need different Bible translation. And sometimes we need the people who know those languages to tell us what is in. Because here in this clause, it's one of the most significant words that we have in the book of Revelation. I'm repeating. One of the most significant expressions in the book of Revelation and these words really tell us how to interpret the book. Okay, so what is the word? Let's read one more time the last clause. It says, and he, Jesus, he sent, and now I have here, and says, and he communicated it by his angel to his servant, John. I'd like to invite all of you and our viewers, you probably have different versions here in front of yourself. My new American standard Bible says that Jesus communicated, he sent and he communicated it to John. Dear viewers, if you have in your hand King James Bible, for instance, you will find that the King James Bible has a different word. It says signified, that Jesus signified. By the way, you who are here in front of me, I'll say that you see that even my new American Standard Bible says here in the margin that the correct word should be signified. Mm -hmm. So the word that Jesus communicated, it's actually an interpretation. Um, for instance, a new international version has that Jesus showed to John. Let us try to see what the meaning of this word is all about. I'd like to suggest to you that the King James Bible, or the New King James Bible, together what is found here in the margin of my Bible translation that I have here, are the closest to the meaning that the word is in Greek. So, again, as I did last time, I want a little bit to challenge you that you see how it looks in Greek. 
So the word that is in Greek here is semaino. This is S, so called sigma, okay, in Greek. It's the word semaino. So what is the meaning, the meaning of this word? Let's do a little bit analysis of this word, and I hope that this will not be boring again. The word semaino, it's a verb, but comes from the noun. You see, if you cover these letters, then what is left? It's the word sema, which is a noun, feminine noun. Actually, there is also in the book of Revelation another word, noun, that is very similar to sema, which is semaion, which is actually neuter but the meaning is the same. So what is the meaning of the word sema? It simply means a sign or a symbol. I will, I will show you something from the book of Revelation just in a few, in few minutes. And I know that our viewers uh, are in international community, in different languages of the world. And if you go anywhere in the world, there is international word, what United States, we call a traffic light. Mm -hmm. It's typically North American expression is. If you go to Britain, where English is the official language, they use the word semaphore. Mm -hmm. Semaphore, which is the international term in Spanish, Portuguese, Croatian language, all languages of the world. This is the official word for the traffic light, semaphore. You will notice. Sema and four. Sema means a symbol, and four is somehow the variation for light. So what is the semaphore of traffic light? You know, when you see green, tells you something. When you see red, means, you see these are all signs that they mean something. When you see red, that sign means stop. By the way, let me use another word that we are very much familiar with is the word semantics. Mm -hmm. Sema means a symbol, and ticks, it's a little bit of change, a transitory term that actually is the word for the text. So what is semantics? When we use symbols to express something that is not visible, you say M, you say T, you see, you don't see it, it's simply breathing, but then you use those signs to express it. That's what semantic is. You use sign or symbols. By the way, this is feminine. Let's go to the book of Revelation to see how a neuter term is used. It's used two times, for instance, in Revelation 12. This is the word that we are talking about. Revelation 12, verse 1. And you will see we are spending a little bit more time on that because this is I dare to say that this is probably a single most important word in the book of Revelation with regard to the interpretation of the book. It says, you have the book, uh, the, the chapter? A great sign, what well, the word is used, semeion, neuter, appeared in heaven. What is this sign? A woman. So please, let's pra practice the knowledge. If semeion means sign or symbol, what does it mean? that what follows is not the real thing. It says a woman, pregnant woman, pregnant with child is there, telling us that this is not a Mary, that this is not an, a woman, that actually it's a symbol that John sees of something. By the way, we will come to Revelation 12. <laughs> okay, let's go to verse 3. Then another Simeon, which is a sign, appeared in heaven. Another symbol, what's that symbol? It's a dragon telling us the dragon is not a literal dragon. Because when we go to verse 9, it says clearly that this dragon is the old serpent who is actually the devil and Satan. I'd like to show to you something, few, few more things that we see how the word is used. Please, I'm taking time for that because, because today people are going and interpret the book of Revelation without really taking into consideration the purpose of the book that Jesus indicated how to be interpreted. Okay, if you go to the Gospel of John chapter 12, 
verses 32 and 33. Then we read there, Jesus said, you know this statement is known, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. This is what Jesus said. But John wrote his gospel many decades after, and he now makes comment on these words of Jesus, and he said, but he, Jesus, was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. Let me, let me, let me make sense of this. Jesus said, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all, my, all people to myself. What's the meaning of that? Evidently, the disciples at that moment did not understand what Jesus was saying. It was decades la later that John understood when he was writing the gospel. After everything what happened with Jesus' crucifixion and his ascension to heaven, and he said that Jesus was saying this. Now, they put the word indicate. Actually, is the word semino used. Let, can you practice it? Jesus said this to show by means of symbol what will happen to him. So we know then, when I'm lifted up, it means the, the cross. Let's see another case. The Gospel of John chapter 21, verses 18 to 19. Verses 18 to 19. Is the book of Revelation very exciting book to start, yeah? Okay, 21. G again, the words of Jesus. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. So these are the words that Jesus said to Peter, but evidently Peter did not understand what Jesus told him. Was that Jesus tried to tell him, you will stretch your hands. Somebody will take you to the place you don't want. Was Actually, it was again decades later when John was writing his book that he understood it and he makes a comment. Now, this he said, signifying the word semino is used. It means showing him by means of symbol what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he has spoken this, he said to him, follow me. So I hope now that we can get a little bit insight into the meaning of the word semino. But there is another word that is probably, uh, an, another biblical passage that is more significant. And when John in Revelation 1.1 quoted the words of Jesus, in using the word semino, actually he had another book in his mind. And that's the book of Daniel. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with or not, but the Bible, yes, originally was written in Hebrew and few chapters were written in Aramaic. But actually it is 300 years before Christ that the Bible was translated into Greek language known as the Septuagint. So Septuagint is Greek translation of the Old Testament. So in Daniel chapter 2, Two, verse 28 of the Septuagint version, we have the following words. I would like us to read it. However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And now, let's pay attention. And he has made known, actually, the word semino is used. <laughs> God made known, what, what, what does it mean? It means that God revealed to the king Nebuchadnezzar by means of symbol what will take place in the latter days. This was your dream and the visions in your mind while you were on your bed. Actually, it is the Septuagint version that uses the word semino to indicate that what the king Nebuchadnezzar saw in that dream was actually a symbol or a symbolic presentation by which God wanted to show the king, to the king Nebuchadnezzar 
what will take place in the future. I hope now that we have already a sense of feeling what the meaning of this word is. So I would like to give you a lexical meaning of this word. It simply means to show or to communicate something by means of sign or a symbol. means to show, to communicate something by means or signs of symbols. So let us now practice this knowledge here. Let's go back to Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. Let's go to the last clause of verse 1. And he, Jesus, he sent and he showed it by his angel by means of symbol to his servant John. I don't know if this is good English, what I, what I express it here, but I hope you were able to get the meaning of this text. As I mentioned, that this is probably a single most important word in the book of Revelation with regard to the interpretation of the book. And the text is telling us, this word is telling us, that when Jesus came and he revealed the content of the book of Revelation to John, what John saw it, what was shown to him, it was not something literal. It was shown to him, to him by means of symbol. Oh, now we uh, have a great discovery now, telling us that John received his visions in visual or figurative presentations. Oh, we learned something new. But please, let us build on this. When I usually talk to my students and different people about, about this. People reach different conclusions. And I will, I will never forget I was in one part of the world talking about this. And then people ask me questions because somebody else who had heard my presentation before was talking to them and telling them, you see, nothing in the book of Revelation is real. Everything is a symbol. And in order to explain to those people what actually the text says, is said, let's take, for instance, New Jerusalem in the book of Revelation. You see, there is no city. It's a simply, simply a symbol of something. Symbol of what? So I had to intervene. And from that time, it was actually, it happened three, four years ago. I used New Jerusalem a little bit to clarify what is this. So it's very important that we keep in mind about this, what was shown to John by means of symbol is that what is in the book of Revelation, what John saw in the vision, are real things, real events, and real systems. Are you still with me? However, it was shown to John in the vision by means of symbols. Okay? So real things but shown to him by means of, 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 of a symbol, okay? And uh, I would like a little bit to clarify it. Since I used already the illustration of a new Jerusalem, please allow me to take a few minutes to talk about this. This is my favorite subject, and probably this is one of the most misunderstood subjects of the book of Revelation. When I was uh, a teenager, um, by that time, I had read the Bible already several times, and I read the book of Revelation. I did not understand too much. When I went to the book of Revelation, there are some things that puzzled me. And one thing is that you read there in chapter 21 that New Jerusalem is the city coming from God. And the city is surrounded by huge walls. Then I asked my parents, they were godly Christians, and other godly people, I asked them, why does New Jerusalem need the walls? And of course, explanation I got, well, you know, we have to feel safe on the new earth. You know, teenagers, they ask strange questions. I said, safe from what? It's the same as, I, I just want to tell you, it's the same as we read about the tree of life and the leaves for the healing of nations. Take different commentators because when we eat those leaves, we will not get sick. 
How is that you will get sick on the new earth? There is no sin any longer. There is no tears. There is no the death there. And you see, so many times we are struggling in order how to understand the book of Revelation. And it's not always easy to understand it. We are struggling with regard to the meaning, meaning of that. So I would like really to go a little bit to, to the book of Revelation, to New Jerusalem issue. Okay. The city is surrounded by walls. Any idea when you go to Revelation chapter 22, how wide are those walls? How wide is the city? Of course, I know we can now go and give different measures, but the, the best uh, um, length that we have here, it's about 1,400 miles, which is in the metric system about 2,000 kilometers. Boy, that's a huge city, huh? Yeah. But please, can you help me now? How deep are the city walls? Again, 100, 1,400 miles. And of course, we can still say, yeah, <laughs> it's a huge city. But we have another problem here. How tall are the walls? 1,400 miles. It doesn't make sense. This, because if you go to Palestine, you can see the best and the safest city in ancient times. They were about 20 yards in height. That's a safe city. But can you imagine 1,400 miles? Actually, I just want to use one joke, when I was in one place a number of years ago, one lady came to me and she said, now I understand why New Jerusalem we cannot see the sun. <laughs> it was just, she, she, was, she, was, she was joking, but it was, it was so cute. Because she, she, what is the purpose of this? By the way, let's explain how the city looks like. Is that? And then we have, I'm sorry, it go like this. Then it go like this, okay? You know this? And then, boy, I'm not an artist, I'm sorry. Okay. How does it work here? No. It goes this. Okay. We see that actually the city is the perfect cube. So what is the meaning of that? And now it brings us to something that is very fascinating. John said, I did not see a temple in the city. Why? Because the Lord God is the temple. I did not see the temple. And I know usually we take this text, but then we go to Revelation chapter 7. It talks about 144,000 telling us that 144,000 will serve God in his temple. So there is a temple in the new earth. And John does not say that there is no a temple on the new earth. He said, I did not see temple in the new Jerusalem. Why? Because there is something fascinating in this. If you go to the Old Testament, the most holy place was a perfect cube. So now, why there is no temple in the city? Because the new Jerusalem functions as the temple of the new earth. And the presence of God makes it temple because where God is present, we have the sanctuary there, we have the temple. Okay, can you help me? What was located in the most holy place of the earthly sanctuary? What was inside? It was the Ark of the Covenant. You remember with that cup right there, mercy seat. What did the Ark of the Covenant symbolize? The throne of God. Now John said, I saw the throne of God in the city. And everybody has access to that throne. Not by faith any longer. We don't need priests any longer. Everybody can, there, can approach to that throne. Come into the presence of God. Because he says, and we will see his face a fin finally. Yes. Please, I want everybody to understand me. 
I'm not here discussing whether New Jerusalem will have walls or not. When we get to one day or day, we will see it. But you keep in mind what John saw on Patmos, it was a real thing. So he saw a real city. However, how can you describe something, as Apostle Paul said, what human eyes did not see? What we never heard with our ears? What cannot come to our mind? This is what God prepared to those who love him. How can John portray the city, or better to say, how could Jesus portray to him a city that is so safe? <laughs> because we know in the first century, during the time of John, a safe city, it meant that that city was surrounded by good walls. Without a wall, it's not a safe city. Nobody would be able, actually would like or want to live in that city. It means anybody can come and, dis and destroy that, 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 that city. So it signified really safety with possibility. Yeah, the new Jerusalem can have the walls, but we want to try to find out the meaning of that, of that reality that John saw to telling us, to telling us that that city will be really, really the temple of God, which is safe. And I, I try always to tell my students, maybe if Jesus showed to John New Jerusalem today, John would say, boy, I saw angels in police cars patrolling their streets, no drug dealers, no criminals there. You see, the, 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 the thing is, it's a safe city. It's the place where God will dwell with, 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 with his people. But symbolic meaning is drawn from the sanctuary system. We have the tree of life and the river there. It's telling us that New Jerusalem will be the lost garden of Eden. And also the concept of the saved city from the time of John. You see that all those elements, keep in mind that God always speaks to the people in the language that people can understand. God speaks to us in our language that we know. It is only the things that we know that we can understand things that are unknown. But please, just one more aspect. I'm tempted now to talk too much about New Jerusalem, and we will talk about that when we reach Revelation chapter 22. One of special aspect of that message given to me is that says, an ethnoi will come to that city from, the, from that word ethnic comes. And the word is translated into English as Gentiles or nations. Will come to that city and bring their gifts uh, to God and their glory to God. When John wrote this, it had a special meaning for him. Yes. At the time of John, there was a city of Jerusalem. And that city had several courts. The widest area around the temp temple was the so-called the, the court of the Gentiles. The Gentiles were allowed only to that court because the Jews did not believe in the conversion of the Gentiles, so they did not care there. But there are many Gentiles, they wanted to come to worship the God of Israel. So they were allowed only to come into that place. There was an next court known as the court of women. Only women were, the women were allowed only in that court. Then there was the next court, next court, the court of Israel, and at the very temple where the priests could come and officiate sacrifices there. And John, while he was in Jerusalem, he could watch. Because from the court of the Gentiles to the next court, the court of women, there at the entrance, there was a huge inscription said, any Gentile who passes through this gate will be responsible for his own death. By the way, if you go to Israel there in museum, you can see that inscription that is found. It's there in, in the museum. The Gentiles were not allowed there. By the way, it was in that court of the Gentiles that the greedy Sadducees invested all kind of business. It is from that court that actually Jesus, you remember that, expelled all those sellers there and, and money exchangers, etc. They did everything to prevent Gentiles to worship and to give glory to the God of Israel. But what do we have now with the new Jerusalem? That the promise that given through the prophet Isaiah and my house will be called the house of prayer 
to all nations, nations, Gentiles, finally will be fulfilled. You see, friends, when we read about the new Jerusalem, and we try to speculate, is it a real city or not? The answer is, it is a real city. It, is, it was shown to John by means of symbols that he could understand, etc. But there is much more in that, that that symbolic language is telling us that with that promised city that God one day will give his people, will have all God's promises given to the humanity finally to be fulfilled. So when we read about that gold and silver, when we read about those precious stones, it's not really, the issue is not about precious stones and gold. It's about the glory of God that we build in a city. And I just want to tell you, I cannot wait. But cross in that city and finally see his face. And that the desire of human beings that is best expressed in the words of Moses, Lord, show me your face. Finally, we will be realized. And we will all be able to see God's face and find ourselves there to the next throne of God. That's what the message of the book of Revelation is. So now the time that is left to us we want to understand a little bit about that symbolic language. So please, we have to ask ourselves one question is, who is that that shows that symbolic language of the book of Revelation? We read clearly in verse 1 that actually it's a Jesus who chose that language to show to John the events that will take place in the future. Are you still with me? Mm -hmm. And God always speaks to the people in the language that they can understand. That's why New Jerusalem is portrayed in such a way. But not only that, when we move on through the book, we see also that so many times when John sees something in the vision, he tried to, to describe it, but the words are lacking. So he chooses his own symbols to explain it. How do you know that, that John so many times chooses his symbols? You will notice, for instance, in Revelation chapter 1, when he sees glorified Christ, he says, his hair was like, his face was like, his eyes were like, his garment was like, his feet were like. When you use the word like, when you say, my daughter, she's thing, uh, she sings like a bird. Bird is a symbol. He is smart like. You see, so many times, John, by using the words like or as, he adds his own symbols. Yes. So now we have the book of Revelation. We want to study. We want to interpret it. But we want to understand that, uh, that symbolic language because what makes the book of Revelation problematic is that symbolic language. So please, I'd like to give you certain principles. I hope it will help us in order to understand that and, and, uh, and uh, uncode, okay, that symbolic languages. When we read the Bible in general, okay, the books of the Old Testament and the books of the New Testament, when we have the text in front of ourselves, we approach the text with presupposition that what we read there in the text, it's literal. Are you with me? Yeah. Some Christians, they don't follow that principle. And let me tell you just an illustration. They read Genesis chapter 1. God created something the first day, something the second day, the third day, and they try to reconcile a little bit with the science. So suddenly those days are not literal, but are symbolic. Some people, they have a problem with the coming of sin in Genesis chapter 3. So that was not a real serpent with Satan. There was something else. Many people, they have problem with the book of Jonah. So Jonah never existed. Jonah is symbol of something else. I'm sorry. I'm conservative Christian who reads the Bible as it is. I believe that the Bible is really the record of what happened, of course, through the lenses of the biblical author. Using his personality, the biblical author portrays what, 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 what happens. 
And it really happened. When you read that, it's so literal, it's, it, it indeed happened. But there is always but. Unless the text indicates clearly that the symbolic meaning is intended. So, so many times we read something in the Bible and we see that the literal meaning does not fit. It's obviously a symbolic meaning. For instance, you read the book of Psalms when David said, many waters, they came against me. <laughs> they are not literal waters. Evidently, that he refers to his enemies. Or when you read in Isaiah chapter 5, he said, let me sing a song about my dear one. My dear one has a vineyard. He put a tower there in the vineyard. He put a fence around it. And later he explains, few verses later, Isaiah chapter 5, he said, the vineyard is the house of Israel. The tower is the law of God that is put there. So, so you see, we are dealing with symbolic language. So the text must clearly indicate to us that the symbolic meaning is intended. Now, when we come to the book of Revelation, the principle is completely opposite. When you have the text in front of yourself, from the book of Revelation, you read the book of Revelation, you come with presupposition that this text is symbolic. How do you know that? Because at the very beginning of the book of Revelation, John makes very clear that what Jesus showed to him in the vision was shown by means of symbol. Are you still with me? Unless the text indicates clearly that the symbolic or figurative, sorry, that literal meaning is intended. Are you with me? So, when we read when John said, by the way, we will do it very soon, when John said, I, John, your brother, I was on island called Patmos. It's obvious that it is literal. Or when he says, when I saw the angel speaking to me, I fell down before he, his feet and he said, don't do it. I simply like servant like you. It's literal meaning. Okay. So in order to establish certain principles, we want to recognize difficulties in the book of Revelation because to determine what is literal and what is symbolic, it's not always clear to us. We have already the principle. What John sees in the vision, what was shown to him, and what he wrote down in the book, it was, it was by means of symbol. But sometimes there are some difficult things. Because you see, some symbols are very clearly explained in the book. For instance, we already uh, mentioned it in chapter 12. John talks about the dragon beside that pregnant woman. You remember that? In chapter, in verse 7 to verse 9, he makes very clear that the dragon was the devil of Satan. If you go to Revelation chapter, chapter 17, John sees a prostitute Babylon sitting on many waters. In verse 15 of the same chapter, he explains that the water upon which the prostitute was sitting signifies secular and political powers of this world. You see, there are many symbols in the book clearly explain. But what is the problem? That many symbols are not explained. And this is actually the, that adds difficulty to us when we un try to understand the book of Revelation. So to determine sometimes what is literal and what is symbolic or figurative in the book of Revelation, it's not an easy task for the interpreter. And we will come, for instance, uh, to Revelation 16. We have seven last plagues. When we read the last three plagues, fifth, sixth, and seven, it's clearly that it is symbolic. We have river Euphrates. The fifth plague strikes the throne of the beast. In the seventh plague, you had the fall of Babylon. It's clearly the symbolic language. And that's not the problem. But when we deal with the first plague to fourth, striking the sun, the water, 
etc. It's not clear to us. And I will show to you, strictly on the basis of the book of Revelation, you'll be surprised that actually it's literal, it's not symbolic. So you see, in one chapter, one more time, we're using our best abilities and help of the Holy Spirit to understand it. The first four seals we interpret as literal, the last three as symbolic. So you see, it tells us about, about the difficulty. By the way, we will come also to Revelation chapter 6. You know that about the darkening of the sun, of the moon, and the falling of the stars. There are today some Christians, they believe that it's figurative, it's symbolic, it's not literal sun. By the way, I will show to you exactly from the book that it is literal. You don't need to doubt about that. But just a few years ago, we were struggling. We did not know how from the book to show if it is literal or symbolic. So it's not always easy. And I'd like to encourage all of you and, and our viewers is, when we have a, some symbols of the book of Revelation, and the book does not show to us clearly whether it is literal and symbolic, we can disagree. But instead of fighting, we should listen to each other. Mm -hmm. Study together. Not the other people disagree with me, they're heretics. Because of that, they disagree with me. Mm -hmm. It means that we have a difficulty in the book. We have to study, we have to pray together. Only when we are united, when we study the text together, we can find the answer. Mm -hmm. But disagreeing, we will, we will never, never able, able to reach it. I just want that you, that you are aware, even though we have certain guidelines, and, 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 and principles. At the beginning of the book, John makes very clear what was shown to him. It was shown to him by, by symbol, but it's not everything so simple, as, as simple as it looks like. So I would like to encourage you, you know, that we do it. So now, how to interpret that symbolic language? You see, it's a symbol, but how to interpret it? One of the ways to interpret the symbolic language is today to take newspapers <laughs> and to interpret it. But what is the problem? That John the Revelator, when Jesus showed to him those visions, he did not have New York Times or Time Magazine, etc. You already have a hint how to do it. So it means when Jesus showed to John those visions, in what language? Or what kind of symbols did Jesus choose to communicate to John? The symbol that he understood 2,000 years ago. So now people are asking, what do you scholars, what, what are you doing when you interpret the book of Revelation? We search ancient literature from the time of John in order to understand what those symbols meant to John and to those Christians at the time when John, when John lived. So we have to understand, we have to understand that the book of Revelation was originally written 2,000 years ago, not in 21st century. It was written in the language of the people of that time. Another point is, we have also to keep in mind is as we interpret that symbolic language, that symbolic language was not abstract. It was pictorial. What does it mean? That when that language was chosen, it was taken from the history of God's people of the past, of the past. So when Christians of the time of John, when they read it, when we read today, it's not only about the symbol, it's about the great message that is given to us. So the time is, is left, we have a few minutes, so please allow me, because the viewers will say, I'm studying the book of Revelation. Yes, I have your commentary. My commentary is written for the primary purpose, not always to give you the interpretation, but to help you in understanding the symbol, okay? But you say, I would like to search deeper. Where can I find the meaning of those symbols? In order to uh, provide the answer to that question, we ask ourselves a question, where was the symbolic language of the book of Revelation taken from? And let me be frank with you. It's very simple. It was actually 
almost 100 years ago that some famous scholars, they went verse by verse, verse by verse, phrase by phrase, and they went to the Old Testament and they discovered, you know, when you put all the verses of the book of Revelation, when you put them together, we have 404 verses. That actually today we know that more than 300 verses of the book of Revelation, 300 verses of the book of Revelation, you can trace them directly to the Old Testament. See, that symbolic language is taken from there. Why is that so? Keep in mind that the book of Revelation, it's like a parable that Jesus did. So when God wanted to inform his people through John that at the time of the end there will be a power that will God's people trying to destroy them. If you want to use a parabolic story to tell them what you would use, you use the language that says that that power will be called Babylon. Now everything becomes clear. Because the early Christians in the first century knew who Babylon was. It was a tool and instrument in the hands of Satan, responsible for taking the people of Israel in Babylon, etc. Yeah. So what happened in the past finally will happen in the future. Let me show to you another illustration. Revelation chapter 12, we mentioned it. I'm going back to that. John sees a woman that is pregnant, in pain to deliver a child. And then there is a dragon there waiting for the child to be born, to be destroyed. Let me ask you something. Now you have to help me. What suddenly picture come to your mind? A woman that is in pain to bear a child, and there is a dragon that is the enemy trying to destroy the child. What comes to you? Genesis 3.15. When God said to the woman, you will in pain bear ch uh, uh, children? but I make making enmity between you and the Satan. Between. He will trample on your head. You see that? You have here the fulfillment of that promise. Another one. We read in in book of Revelation chapter, chapter 15, how 144,000 are standing there at the sea of glass, singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Just, they, they have come out of the seven last plagues. What, what suddenly comes to your mind? The Egyptian plagues and people of Israel at the Red Sea there, Mary, Miriam actually, leading that song, the song of Moses, singing to God. You see that the entire book of Revelation is written like that. So if you really want to understand the meaning of that symbolic language, what is the first step? Go back to the Old Testament. You cannot miss it. More than 80% of all that symbolic language is taken to, from the book of Revelation. Let me just, if you, if you be with me, the word the Lamb, the root of David, sealing of the faithful, the seven seals, the trumpets, 144,000 standing at the sea of glass, locusts from the abyss, the image of the beast, Sodom and Egypt, Babylon, drying up of Euphrates, the seven last plagues, New Jerusalem, Gog and Magog, etc., etc., etc. They're all taken, taken from the Old Testament. I, I want just to go quickly here. We will see, we'll come to the, to the second trumpet. It talks about great mountain in Revelation 8, verses 8 to 9. Um, great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. The third of the sea became, became blood. By the way, if you go to Jeremiah chapter 51, we're talking about Babylon destroying mountain, destroying the earth, and that, uh, that mountain will be thrown into the sea and will be destroyed. You see, then the book of Revelation is not as difficult as it appears. That symbolic language is much easier to understand when you know what that symbolic language was taken from. But just briefly to mention, we have some remaining parts of the book of Revelation. We try to understand that symbolic language. By the way, some of that symbolic language was taken from the New Testament. John also used the symbols from Asia, from the time where he lived, in the same way as we use the symbolic language. But much of that symbolic language was taken from the Jewish apocalyptic literature. You see, when the Jews came out of the Babylonian exile, 
there is a huge stream of literature that was written trying to explain to the people about those unfulfilled prophecies of the Old Testament, why they did not uh, uh, take place. And they used the language of the book of Daniel. They added many other symbols, many books. So that symbolic language was so much in the minds of, 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 of God's people of Israel during the time and early Christians that did not have difficulty when they read about the woman, when they read about the beast, when they read about horn, when they read about uh, 1260 days. There was no difficulty to understand it because this is the language they used in a synagogue. They used in their conversations um, about the Old Testament, about God's unfulfilled prophecies. You see, friends, how the book of Revelation is given in the real world. It speaks so powerfully. It spoke to the people who lived at the time of John 2,000 years ago. Keep in mind that the book of Revelation was not written to us today. I know I know what you think. It was not written to us today. It was written to those Christians 2,000 years ago. But it was not written for them only. It was written for us as well. But originally, it was written to them. So we need a little bit to be acquainted about the way how the book of Revelation was written. We have to, to be familiar with that symbolic language, about the sources from which that symbolic language was taken from. But about all, I'd like to advise you, when you take the book of Revelation, the first thing, go down to your knees, close your eyes and say, the Lord, I am doing my best. I want to understand the message of the book of Revelation. So please speak to me. Give me your Holy Spirit. Use all those good tools. This is the best textbook. Other tools. Pray to God. And the book of Revelation speak will to you powerfully. Mm -hmm.